So uh, I'll get started. So thank you for, uh, for inviting me. Uh, it's a pleasure. I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person, circumstances being as they may. Um, I'm sure the weather is much better there than it is here in Chicago. Um, so, um, so this work is joint work with John Anuchkun, who's um, on the faculty at the University of Illinois in Chicago, and this is actually her, um, her dissertation topic. Um, we uh, published the paper on which this is based about, um, uh, well, last September, uh, showed up at Operations Research. Um, and um, I'll give you just try to step, step you through the paper and give you um, some, some idea of, of um, what's in it. It's a pretty long paper. Um, the work started um, with uh, the discussions we had with GE Research Labs um, probably, uh, I don't know, eight, nine years ago, 10 years ago now, something like that. And at that time, GE was um, very involved, um, as I suspect they still are, um, uh, on uh, producing hardware for smart meters around the country. Um, and that was where uh, we originally learned about um, this topic, um, smart meters and the ramifications for, uh, for the power industry, and in particular, this question of um, smart homes and what uh, this new technology can enable in terms of smart homes. Um, so just to motivate things, um, and uh, I'm sure there are many people in the audience who uh, uh, know more about this particular topic than, than me, um, but um, just to give you some motivation, um, you may remember, or maybe you have no awareness because you live in California, um, of the polar vortex that we happened that happened here in Chicago back in January of 2014. Um, these are people social distancing uh, here in downtown Chicago in 2014, um, and uh, and so uh, the when this happened, there were all these calls for people to conserve electricity. Um, and the reason was because uh, the authorities were worried that, you know, power plants would start to fail because it was negative 40 degrees, you know, below zero. Uh, and um, there was concerns about um, power failures and uh, which would be are highly dangerous in, in this kind of situation. And of course, the costs. Um, and so this is the trajectory of the spot prices for electricity um, in uh, dollars per kilowatt hours um, over the course of 24 hours on this day. Um, and as you can see, you know, there's a lot of uh, fluctuation with it jumping up to almost $2. Um, so uh, now, part of the reason why there was all this, uh, uh, all these announcements, these public service announcements to ask the population to conserve electricity is because uh, consumers, as we know, don't see these prices. So the prices that these people, were, that the that the people in the Midwest and Chicago in particular, were were seeing were the flat. It's the flat price of ten cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, and so on this day, there was no way to use price signals as a way to to cause um, consumers to curtail um, their consumption of electricity uh, because all they saw was this red line. And so, um, and so you know, the hope was by um, using the radio and the television and all that, social media, that we could um, somehow get people to curtail. Um, so this, of course, begs the question, what would happen or what would have happened if you, um, if instead you passed to the consumers that price signal, uh, would they have conserved or not? Um, and this is, uh, this is what's uh, known as uh, price-based demand response. So in general, demand response is the idea of managing customer consumption of electricity in response to changing supply conditions. And so this is your old, you know, your old meter that you used to have on your, on your home and it has these little dials and on these dials, you know, I don't know how you read them, but you know, the meter person would come and read the dial uh, and, and record once a month what your consumption was 
and you know they actually it's actually keeping track of cumulative consumption so they take the difference between two readings one month apart and that's how you get your your power bill nowadays um we've got now these smart meters um that are on home on homes this is in fact a ge one uh and uh, these are uh, now electronic they they can record consumption of electricity um, in uh, very short time intervals of minutes um, and so uh, the last time I checked about um, a third of US homes um, have smart meters that number may be maybe higher now um, and so uh, that creates an opportunity. So the smart meter uh, becomes now an enabler for all sorts of things. So, um, so as I said, there's this communication between the smart meters and ComEd, uh, which is our, our power company, our power utility here, um, in terms of relaying uh, power consumption over time. Um, but there's also an opportunity for ComEd um, to send signals back to the home as well. And it could be through the smart meter, it could be through some other internet connection. Um, happens in various ways. And there's two basic uh, kinds of signals that a power utility can send. One is called direct load, what we'd call direct load control signals, which would say, hey, you know, uh, supply is tight, um, we're having issues. Um, and so, you know, you alert the homes, you send, just send out a signal to, uh, to the homes to conserve electricity. And if you've got um, appliances in the home that can read that signal, they can then, you know, downshift into a lower power mode. Um, in some instances, um, you know, the power utility can, can actually um, control air conditioners and things like that, change thermostat settings. So there's different ways in which these direct load control signals um, can, can be set up. Um, the other way to do it would be to send dynamic prices. Um, and so rather than uh, try to optimize people's homes and their consumption of power, we instead send them price signals and then we let everybody optimize their consumption relative to those price signals. There's evidence from uh, pilot studies. Um, each one of these dots is a pilot study. Um, and there's evidence that um, consumers will respond to price signals. Um, and uh, what I'm showing on the x-axis, this comes from this uh, paper, um, it's referenced below, looking at the ratio of the peak uh, price to the off-peak price. So like a, the peak price would occur between you know, 4 p.m. and 8 p.m. Um, and so under a peak pricing policy, there'll be a, a jump in price uh, during that time frame compared to the off-peak times. And so, you know, if you charge 20 times what you normally charge during those peak times, you would expect somebody to start shutting down some lights. And in fact, they do. Uh, and, uh, you know, power down their air conditioners or whatever. And, uh, and furthermore, uh, if you give consumers enabling technologies, um, you can actually get more benefits. And so here you're seeing, you know, reductions of, you know, 10 to 20 percent with price signals only, and you can get more, you know, 30 percent ish um, from uh, from uh, if you actually have enabling technologies like, you know, light up globes and things like that, alarms and sensors um, and uh, other technology. So. Um, so, uh, of course, this begs the question, uh, how should the prices be set? And um, the, uh, there, is, um, there is, of course, uh, now a, a large market for these smart thermostats, um, one of the most famous ones of which is the Nest um, Learning Thermostat, um, which many of you, if not all of you, know about. Um, and the thing about the Nest thermostat is it's able to uh, respond to occupancy and it's able to learn over time what temperature you like it at five o'clock when you're home. Um, and so uh, this is, uh, and it's very easy to use and slick. Um, so, uh, and so this, this is, uh, you know, usually popular device. Um, and um, it also has a really nice API in it. Uh, to my knowledge, it's not um, uh, price sensitive. 
However, it has, uh, as I said, a nice API associated with it where you could program it to be price sensitive. Um, there's another thing about the Nest thermostat. If you actually start looking at the algorithm, uh, it's hard to know exactly what the algorithm is, um, but, um, but just based on, on what you can learn about how it works, um, it's occupant aware. So it's aware when someone's home or when someone leaves, um, you know, people put them in different rooms and it can keep track of whether or not rooms are occupied or not. Um, and so the idea is that when someone leaves the home or when the home is empty, you know, it can power down the, the air conditioner because it, it detects that no one's there. Uh, and vice versa, when someone comes home, it can detect that someone's come home and turn on. Um, but, uh, to my knowledge, it doesn't um, anticipate occupancy, which is a different idea. So it doesn't say I'm predicting that my owner will come home with some probability in the next three hours and I'm gonna start to optimize the temperature of my home. Um, it, um, it, it instead is just aware of, um, of when people are, are there or not. And the same thing is true for the prices, it's not um, you can program it to be price aware, but basically, um, my understanding is that it's, it's not. Um, anyway, so, um, so the goal of this research, um, this research has three, three basic goals. One is to develop a framework for studying demand response based on first principles for doing a few things. So one is just optimizing the price signals of utilities to smart homes to maximize social welfare. And, you know, when, uh, when dynamic pricing in the power industry is discussed, it's often, you know, oftentimes you hear concerns that, you know, that the power companies are going to price gouge and set these prices in some irrational way that profits them. Um, so this is um, one important question. How do you calculate um, the right price signals? Two, optimizing the operation of smart homes with price responsive appliances. So uh, so if you look at John and thesis, she has, um, you know, models for different kinds of appliances in the home and how they would respond to price signals to optimize their operation over time. Um, and then thirdly, um, to conduct market equilibrium analyses. And this is where sort of the, the energy policy part of it comes into play. Um, so you want to be able to answer questions for policymakers like what would happen if you gave everybody a smart meter uh, or a smart thermostat uh, and they implemented what what would be the impact on the on the um, on the uh, the load power load and the costs and so on and so forth that kind of question would be important if you're thinking of subsidizing you know the equipment and so on and so forth so um, so in this talk and in this paper, we focus on one and three, um, and two is um, uh, two is is in work we've done elsewhere. Um, quick literature review: um, you know this idea of of uh, real time or dynamic pricing of electricity uh, has been a, around for a really really long time. It's been like fifty years at least that economists have stated, oh yeah, you know customers. Uh, consumers should pay marginal costs, uh, should pay spot prices for electricity. Um, so that idea has been around for a long time. Um, and uh, it's associated with the peak load pricing literature. Um, in most of this literature, there's an assumption of linear price schedules. Um, it's kind of assumed from the, from the get-go. Um, but it's not been until now with all this new hardware technology, um, internet and whatnot, that we've actually been able to, we actually had the technology to do it. Um, and so, uh, and so it's an uh, exciting area. There's other research um, that has been done. It seems like it kind of comes and goes over time, you know, so there were people in the 90s that were looking at um, uh, this idea, uh, having AC controllers, um, you know, spot prices and, you know, there's work now on, you know, selling power back to the grid if you've got, you know, solar panels and these kinds of things. So uh, anyway, uh, so there's a lot of research and I'm sure I left off, I definitely left off lots of, lots of other things, but I kind of view it as sort of the economics literature and there's kind of this engineering technology literature. All right. So let me give you just an overview of, um, of uh, 
what the, the framework that's built in this paper. So our goal in the paper, as I said, was to build a build a framework that um, you know that could be used, you know, plug and play. So if, if you've got your own you know uh, model for an appliance in the home, you could plug it into our framework and study it. Um, in our paper, we we look at um, our version of a smart thermostat, which I'll show you, I'll show you in a minute or two. Um, and um, but anyway, but here's the general framework. Um, so we have a power utility, um, and um, and this utility observes some global environmental parameter uh, WT, which I'm thinking of as the weather, but it could be you know the price of oil uh, and other things. Um, so, uh, but just think of it as as the weather. And the thing about the weather is that everybody knows the weather. Um, if you look outside, uh, everyone knows the weather. So this is common knowledge um, to all of the homes. We then index the homes with uh, index I, and there's a lot of homes, you know, potentially millions of homes um, that we're looking at. Each home is able to observe, as I said, the weather, um, WT, but there's also a home state. Uh, so home I in time period T, um, has a uh, has a state, uh, and we're thinking of this state as um, a multi-dimensional vector of some sort. It would it could be occupancy in our in the case of our smart thermostat. It's who's home, who's not at home, um, the indoor temperature, uh, those kinds of things, um, and then what happens then is um, over time as T you know, moves from one time period to the next, I'm thinking of time periods of about a day, of a, sorry, of, a, of an hour. Um, each home will decide how much, um, how much load, how much um, kilowatts to consume uh, for each period and call that QIT. And they'll ask the utility to supply that, that, um, that load. And then the key here is that the utility then um, charges the homes for, for their consumption. Um, and so what we've done is we've started out, rather than just assume, as most of the literature does, that there's a particular price uh, structure, in particular a linear price structure for how much the utilities are going to charge for, um, for this load for each home. Instead, what we've done is started out with the most general, the gen most general function we could uh, and then see if we can say anything about what what form it should satisfy. So, so literally, this is just a completely general function P I T, which is the price um, that is charged by the utility um, to home I in period T when they consume load Q I T, and the weather outside is W T or the, the global environment variable is W T. So uh, now. Uh, notice that this price function does not depend on the state of the home, which is really crucial to all of this because um, there's privacy concerns. Um, you know, the power utility can't know who's home. Uh, and so um, they can't know the temperature inside your home, so on and so forth, um, at least not by default. Um, so what we're looking for is a price um, is a pricing scheme that um, that where there's some asymmetric information where um, where the power utility doesn't know the state of each home, but yet notice that this allows every home to have its own price. So my neighbor could have a different price schedule than me potentially if they have a big mansion and I have a little small home, maybe there'll be a different price schedule for us. I don't know. All right. So, um, so the way, the way the system works is there's a power company and um, this power company supplies the load, um, which in each period T um, is the sum of these QITs where I is summing over the homes. So that's the total load supply. And CT um, is a uh, of the cost in period, um, you know, it's a cost function for period T. This cost function is really um, there to capture, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a simple function that captures the costs of supplying the power. 
uh, and it will depend not only on the total load, but also um, the number of customers that you're supplying to. And it could also depend on WT, which is the um, uh, WT, which is the, the global environment variable. Now each home, uh, and I've just, you know, one, two, three, all the way up to however many there are, millions, um, has its own uh, process by which um, um, their state uh, their homes are, the homes are evolving. So each home, so home I has a state H1T, which is their state in period one. They then make a load decision, Q1T, um, and then the power is supplied. Um, they, um, they collect some utility. That utility depends on this global variable W, their state of their home and their load requested. And then there's a demand, there's a shock, delta 1T, which then uh, dictates how they transition from one state to the next. Um, so then that leads the home into a new state and then they, they do it again. So the home, each individual home, of course, the decisions that, uh, the load decisions that a home makes over time um, uh, are, there's, uh, you know, the decisions you make in any given period impact the decisions that the home will make later. I mean, if you, Conserve. If you pre-cool the home, the home will be colder later, so you don't have to run the air conditioner as much. Um, and so each of these homes, managing them by themselves is a non trivial problem. So now um, what you could do is you could think about, at least theoretically, setting up an optimization problem that optimizes the whole system. You know, so imagine a power company who had complete visibility into every home and could optimize the load uh, across all the homes. That, of course, is a crazy problem, intractable, violates basic information uh, constraints and things like that. So that, that doesn't make much sense. But, um, but what we do, as I said, is we instead um, have the power company sent each home uh, its own price schedule in the form of these, these functions, P. All right, so the question is, how do you compute the piece? Um, so, um, now, um, one of the, um, when we compute the P's, what we're looking at is, uh, is a special class of policies that are decentralized policies where um, each agent chooses their own policy that depends only on the information they have available. So, um, so the, the global load W and, um, and the state of their home H. Um, and uh, what it means for it to be a decentralized policy is that conditional on the global variable W and the states of all the homes, the probability of seeing a vector of load requests is actually equal to the product of the probabilities of the individual homes. Um, and, um, and so that's the class of policies that we're looking at. Um, and so here is the decentralized pricing problem. So what we want to do is find the price schedules to give to each home such that we maximize the expected social welfare. What is that? Well, that's the overtime, summing over time. It's the total utility from consuming power minus the cost of supplying that power. Um, where each uh, home I is being operated using a policy pi I and that that policy depends on the prices that are being sent to that home the PITs um, and so um, and so each uh, home solves its own net utility maximization problem so it's trying to control its air conditioner or some other appliance in the home um, to maximize the expected utility that the home or the homeowners derive from, uh, from, from uh, consuming that power minus the price that's paid to uh, central uh, for, uh, for the power based on this general price function. And of course, there's constraints on the load and there's a transition law that transitions the home from one state to the next. Um, okay, so, uh, so that's the problem. Doesn't look easy, uh, but uh, we can say some things about it. Um, so let me give you just an overview of some of the things you can say about it. So for one thing, um, there exists optimal price functions that satisfy um, this equilibrium condition. Um, 
which um, you know looks complicated, but intuitively it's it says that um, the price, the uh, or there exists an optimal price function such that the price that's given to home I in time period T for consuming load QIT given the weather's WT um, is the expected incremental cost of adding this home I's load to the to the whole city. So this home's load is this little QIT. So this is the cost of adding this home's load to the whole city minus the cost of just pretending the customer doesn't exist at all. So this is the incremental, it's the expected incremental cost to the system. So that part of it is straightforward, but there's, um, but this thing is a lot more subtle than just that because it's an equilibrium condition. So, um, and so what's happening is, is that the prices depend on the policies that the customers are using, the homes are using it, um, uh, to, to decide their loads. On the other hand, the policies that the customers are using depend on the prices. They show up here. So prices are on both sides, the left side and the right side, okay? Um, so it's an equilibrium condition. Um, and the homes themselves, even though it looks as if the homes are kind of not connected, they are connected to each other because um, the problem is, is that if I don't consume power now and just let my house warm up in the middle of summer, um, then in another hour or two, I might chill it. And then uh, that could cause the prices, um, the load on the system, the central system to generate the generation system to go up, up which then causes the price of my neighbor to go up. And my neighbor's responding to that price. And the solution to this is an equilibrium of all of those intertemporal complicated dynamics that occur. Um, maybe my neighbor's house isn't very well insulated, mine is, and all of that's gonna come into play here um, in, in calculating these prices. So um, an important question to ask is when are optimal price schedules linear? Because so much of the literature just assumes they're linear uh, it's a useful question to ask, you know, why, why does a linear price schedule just work for you? Well, here is how um, uh, our problem simplifies in, in, in a very, very simple, simple case of one period only. There's no weather outside. There's only one agent. And so in this case, what we're doing is we're just trying to find a price function P, P of Q, that maximizes the expected social welfare, there's only one agent, um, subject to um, for every state of the home, the agent will choose a load that maximizes its utility. Okay, so uh, this is analogous to our situation, much simplified, because the P here only depends on the load and not the state of the home. Okay, now, the key is, is that if the, you allow the price to depend on both the state of the home and the load, then it's not too hard to see that it's optimal to set the, the price schedule to be equal to be linear in Q. So it's the marginal cost is to be evaluated at the optimal load Q star of H, okay, which doesn't depend on B. And so it's just that number depends on the state of the home, different for each state of the home, times the Q. And if you plug this in, you see, in fact, that, um, that this, this works and it does solve the social welfare problem, okay? Uh, but this is not our setting because you can't observe, um, we can't have the prices be dependent on the state of the home. Um, so if you stare at this enough, you realize that, well, one way to solve this problem is just to let P equal to C. So if you literally just pass the whole cost function down to the agent, um, then, you know, then they'll do the right thing to maximize social welfare, but then that cost function is gonna be nonlinear, not linear, okay? So, um, so we have some analysis in the paper. Uh, this is kind of technical, but basically what it says is that, um, that, um, that if you're adopting an optimal decision rule um, that um, you can, you know that the um, that the price that the price schedule that induces that um, um, is um, it has sort of the same shape as the price function around the optimal loads uh, that you choose. 
Uh, so all the derivatives are equal, just kind of locally around. So what that means is that um, is that you're not in general um, going to get a linear price schedule out of this thing unless the cost function is linear. Uh, but our cost function is not linear. Um, in fact, you know, if you look at the the cost curves, generation cost curves based on different uh, sources of of, uh, of electricity, you know, the costs go up. Um, they're convex, non decreasing in the load. So. Uh, what we do is we set up a cost function, um, which is um, uh, for, for the whole city. Um, so QIT here denotes uh, a city of, of, you know, agents or homes I here, uh, sub T, and we're summing up over um, all of the homes. This, this is the total load. And so the cost is a function of the total load, the number of homes in the city and the weather outside, we assume that it takes this form. So this form is I, so it's the number of homes times the cost per home. And the cost per home is based on some cost function, which is a function of the average load per home and the weather outside. Um, and so the idea here is that as a city gets large, the cost to supplying power to a home doesn't go to zero. There's some you know, there's some number, but it asymptotically, um, it grows, assuming that the average load of a home is converging to something, then the cost looks sort of linear asymptotically um, in the number of homes. All right, um, but the cost function itself, the, c, the little c here is convex. Um, now, if you assume this, and it's a reasonable assumption, under some other basic uh, math assumptions, including that you know you get some kind of strong law of large numbers kind of thing, then it turns out that the optimal price signal to send, uh, in fact, is just a p times q, which is the assumption we we uh, we often just make. It's p times q, where the price depends on time, it depends on the weather um, w t, it does not depend on the home. So homes get the same linear price signal. Um, and we call this the small home result because even if my neighbor has a McMansion, uh, he's still small uh, compared to the whole city. So, um, and I'm small too. So, um, and so that's why uh, it's a, you know, we call this the small, small home result. Um, all right, so, um, so that's really, really useful. One huh? quick question, one of yeah. the audience has a question on the modeling that may be nice if you want to answer. Yeah. Um, it's on the Q&A. Sure. I can't, for some reason, I can't see that little panel. Let me see here. Right. Um, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't show up. Hold on a minute. So. Yeah, do you want to, why don't you uh, admit them because I don't seem to be. Nicola, able to... would you mind turning, uh, raising your hand and I can unmute you to ask your question? Nicola, uh, if you're here, can you raise your hand and I can unmute you for asking your question? So the, the question that has been asked uh, here, so. Here she is. Uh, okay, you can ask your question now. Yeah, so the, my question was, is there a way to integrate uh, learnings uh, around individual home cooling behavior, for example, it doesn't have to be cooling, but it, um, that you can integrate into the model uh, to, to be a predictor of demand. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, that's a great question. I, I'm actually suppressing um, something important here. Um, so uh, let me see. So back right here so you see um pi i is in the arc max of this thing um so um so what's happening is is that every home has its own uh markov decision process essentially that it's um solving and inside of this this home is is evolving over time according to its own thermodynamic properties so its own heat transfer its own insulation, all that kind of stuff. So, um, so that's all in here. And when we go and compute numbers with it, as I'm about to show you, 
uh, we do take into account all of those different home specifications. So, so for example, you could figure out what the impact would be of changing, you know, if you could double everyone's, um, you know, insulation uh, across the city, what would be the impact on the price in a market equilibrium? We could totally do that. But also, as you were mentioning, Nest, for example, is learning about the individual home and oh, yeah. when people are home, maybe uh, the cycling of the cooling, that sort of thing that you, you might yeah. be able to integrate into the model. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so this is, so I'm assuming underneath the hood that we've learned the, the transition probabilities for occupancy, say, um, and, um, and, you know, and the parameters that dictate the utility function how hot or cold you like it in your house. Um, so I, I'm assuming we've already collected enough information to be able to populate these uh, home specific functions, if that makes sense. Um, so yeah, but you could, if you didn't know them and you had to learn them over time, um, that would be an interesting extension of all this. Um, Great, thank you. Yeah, sure, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, where am I? Yeah. All right. So let me see if I can try to, um, let me try to just wrap up because we're, um, to leave some time for questions, but, um, we have an algorithm for adapting these prices and for simulating a whole city. Um, what you can do is you can partition the homes into different types of homes. Um, and then for each home type, you can aggregate them together to simulate a whole city. And this is kind of an adaptive algorithm for, for tuning those prices over time. Um, so even though we're not learning about the homes preferences and whatnot, we are learning the prices over time here in order to compute the equilibrium. Let me just say something about uh, the thermostat. So I'm gonna show you some numerical results from running, uh, running this, um, computing these prices and whatnot. Um, and I do it on our version, our vision of uh, the smart thermostat, which is quite a bit smarter than Nest. Um, not on the front that Nicola just brought up, but uh, in terms of anticipating um, um, occupancy and anticipating price movements. Um, and so, um, and so we're not only going to learn, you know, so occupant aware means not only learns the behavior, but anticipates it. So it, it's anticipating that the owner is going to come home at five o'clock with some probability and with some probability they don't come home till midnight. Um, and it's price responsive, meaning that, um, you know, it sees that the price it's anticipating that the price is going to go up uh, by early afternoon and you better do something about it now. Um, I'm not going to go into detail about how we fit, you know, here's a dynamic program for that does all this for the, for the smart thermostat. Let me just show you, now that you have some sense of what our thermostat does, the key is, is that it, it sets the, it's, it moves the, it consumes power for the air conditioner based on anticipating price movements and occupancy. That's the main thing you need to know. So, um, so here I've got a, just to give you uh, an illustration, um, I've got one home, it's occupied by a single person who lives alone. Um, and they have a very regular schedule and there's their schedule every day is the same. Uh, and, uh, they sleep, they get a good eight hours of sleep. So this isn't a student. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, they're active early in the morning for a couple hours. Um, the hottest day of 2011 was July 20th. And so I'm just going to show you what happens on that day. And they're willing to pay 20 cents. So, um, per kilowatt hour. So, here is the outside temperature on that day. This is the hottest day of the year. It spiked up to almost 100 degrees on that day um, in black is what you see. The prices on that day, the actual prices were in green. These are the spot prices coming from the market. And then the flat price is this 10 cents per kilowatt hour, okay, um, to give you sense. So this is one of the, one of the main things I, one of the main things I wanna show you is that this, when you anticipate Things you get interesting behavior. Um, so the green and the red are just um, uh, these are ignoring um, ignoring um, the red is just ignoring everything. It's just a flat price. It doesn't keep track of who's home. The green is a little bit smarter. But the main thing is that I want to show you is the blue and the purple. So in the blue, this is a flat price. So there's no price anticipation at all. It's just 
10 cents on this day, 10 cents per kilowatt hour, but it is occupant aware. Um, and, so, um, and so what it's doing here is, um, this is the indoor temperature over time. Our homeowner likes it like 40, 74, 75 degrees, something like that. And as you see um, at around, um, um, you know, it's basically when the homeowner goes to work or school, the home heats up to, you know, almost 80 degrees here, 78 degrees. And then, um, and then at like one or two o'clock, it starts to cool it off because it's anticipating that the homeowner is going to come home and they don't like it that hot. They like it a little cooler. So, so it's anticipating um, and, and operating by itself, even though no one's home. In contrast, if once you put the prices in there and you allow it to anticipate the prices, it actually has exactly the opposite effect. So the homeowner leaves, um, you know, at nine in the morning and look what it does. It turns the home into an ice cube. <laughs> I mean, it's down to 67 degrees, okay, at noon and no one's home. So why is it doing that? It's doing that because it's anticipating that the price is going to be extremely high later on in the day. And so it's pre-cooling the home so it can shut things down and let the home warm up so that in anticipation of the homeowner coming home at five, it's a good, you know, 74 degrees, which is how they like it when they come home. Um, and so, you know, so you get very different behavior. here. All right. Um, so just quickly, uh, we ran the whole combat service region, 3.4 million residents um, in July of 2011. Um, data from all sorts of places. We fit the cost function using a function from the literature that we call the Barlow, that's called the Barlow function. We compare um, baseline, which is what we do now, nothing smart, maintain a constant indoor temperature, flat pricing with, um, um, with what happens when you put in these smart th thermostats under flat pricing or peak pricing where you double the price during peak hours. Um, versus our prices that come out of our model. So, um, so this is the flat, this is the flat pricing. Um, and I'm showing this as a function of the saturation. So as a hundred percent, so one means everyone has a smart thermostat and 0.01 means basically very few people have it. So you can see how the curves change. This is not so interesting. The main thing is that my thermostat knows you're sleeping. And so it raises the temperature to conserve power. And that's why it's, um, the load is a little lower at night for me. Um, anyway, but this is interesting. So, um, so if, and this is something you don't see in practice. Um, so if you do peak pricing, so you double the price between 4 p.m. and 8 p.m., my thermostat, which anticipates these price movements, what it does is it consumes a ton of load just before the price increase. Why? Because it wants to cool the home so our, our homeowner is comfortable during this period, right? So it gets it while it's cheap. And so you get a big peak before the load and then it kind of shuts things down. And then right after the peak, it then turns back on again. So there's a lot of concern about there being a second peak, you know, by doing this dynamic pricing, creating it, just moving the peak around. What this is showing is that peak load pricing act can actually create two peaks. And if you don't see this in practice, it's because people don't have thermostats that are as smart as mine. <laughs> um, anyway. So there's that, and then there's um, dynamic equilibrium pricing. So these are the this is uh, these are the prices actually. I'm showing prices on the y-axis over the course of this day, um, and as you see, you know they do go up. This is this hot peak summer day. Um, as saturation, uh, the saturation of smart thermostats uh, goes up, you see that the prices drop. Uh, because there's positive externalities to having all this, um, all these smart meters installed. Um, and then this is the load. And what you see is this behavior of pre-cooling in the morning um, versus in the, you know, later on the day, conserving. Um, that's kind of the behavior that you get. And it's more accentuated the more smart meters you've got or smart thermostats you've got. So anyway, this is my last slide. Um, so just a summary. Uh, so we have um, a generalizable pricing methodology for infinitesimal agents, which are these smart homes. Um, I've shown you that, that the behavior of our smart thermostat, it pre-cools in the morning under dynamic pricing, whereas it, uh, flat pricing will warm in the morning, very different. I showed you that peak pricing can cause two different load peaks. Um, 
The, um, in terms of the social welfare numbers, I've just kind of summarized here because there's a lot of numbers in the paper, but the dynamic equilibrium pricing um, reduces the monthly power bills by as much as 41% uh, based on the assumptions calculations in our paper, which is pretty good, uh, versus 19%, um, which is closer to what like the, the nest does basically. Um, you increase social welfare, you reduce the monthly generation costs, you reduce the system-wide peak load. So all these great benefits um, of, of using smart thermostats and doing dynamic pricing. But, and I'll kind of, I'll end here, um, what we see is that there's a decrease in monthly supplier surplus by as much as 50% um, when you do this dynamic pricing. And so I would assert that this, um, this offers some explanation for why we see such a slow adoption of dynamic pricing, um, real-time spot pricing, you know, in, in um, the consumer, the residential power side of things. Um, because, you know, you know, power companies make money on selling electrons. And so um, they sell fewer electrons, less revenue coming in. And anyway, it looks like they actually, their, their surplus would actually go down uh, significantly. So, so in order to get all these benefits, this suggests that, um, you know, that there would need to be some government intervention of some sort around regulation, supporting the industry uh, to make this to make this more wide, something that happens more widely. Um, so anyway, so I'll just leave it at that and, uh, and I'll take, take any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Professor Edelman. Uh, it's, yeah. It was a really nice uh, presentation, especially now that everyone is at home. We do need more of these smart uh, metering at homes. We have a few questions. I would like to ask people who have uh, submitted their question to Q&A to raise their hand and uh, ask it uh, orally from Professor Edelman. So John, you are, you are on. Go ahead. John, you can ask your question. Okay, hi. Um, the idea of you know, cooling the house when no one's in it is using the thermal mass of the house yes. as storage, basically. But yes. you know, it's quite possible to store energy in forms that wouldn't directly affect the temperature of somebody's in the house. I mean, you wouldn't do this trick mm -hmm. if somebody's in the house during the day, you wouldn't say, oh, we'll just chill you down to 48 degrees because you will save money later. So where do you see this kind of dynamic pricing if more homes had thermal storage? For example, you could make ice in a storage system when power is cheap, whether it's the middle of the night or the afternoon or whatever, and then you use this thermal reservoir to cool the house. You can also do this for heat, storing uh, you know, energy essentially in a phase transition material and then using that to heat the house. I'm curious if you've thought a little bit about how you know, heat storage in, in, in a house would change your pricing models. Yeah, 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 that's very interesting. So, you know, so there's different kinds of power consumption, um, you know, there's the, there's the storable stuff, you know, there's the, the pure, you know, discretionary, um, and then there's the, there's the, the load that can be like deferred, right, time shifted somehow. Um, so, you know, so, well, first of all, I would say, um, yes, those are all great ideas. I think like in terms, we haven't analyzed how these different variations of store, of storable uh, energy would change the pricing, but you certainly could do that with the framework. So if you, you know, so right now, um, the model has, um, you know, there's a heat transfer model that keeps track, you know, that has some notion of the thermal mass of the home and that, and that you're right, it's a storage device. Um, if um, there was a way, so the model currently, as it's implemented in the paper, if it would cool the home and make people, it is taking into account the probability that someone comes home for lunch, it's freaking, freezing in the home, right? And so, um, and so it does keep, it does do that. If you had instead, you just substitute your model uh, that has a thermal mass that doesn't, you know, impinge on the, on the consumer uh, in and instead, then I, my guess is that it would, it would end up actually storing even more 
um, uh, of, of the energy in the thermal mass, you know, with the thermal mass. Um, and what, in fact, would it have on the price? It'd probably be beneficial, would be my guess. But you could certainly just adjust, you know, come up with the model of how the home uh, chooses to, to consume load to build up that energy mass over time, plug it into the framework, and then investigate a question like that. That'd be very interesting. Yeah, hi Dan. Um, so another another question in terms of with the using the price signal to shift behavior, uh, do you run the risk of creating like the Google Map problem, whereby if every uh, smart thermostat is doing the same thing, yeah. uh, that you just end up shifting where the peak load or the expensive loads occur? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so, um, so when we look at the equilibrium, um, we don't see that. You're right, that, that's a concern that's, that's frequently um, brought up, um, that everyone will just shift all their load to you know, some other time and they would all coordinate on that same time. Um, but you know, there's heterogeneity in the homes, um, you know, as we were saying earlier, and there's the heterogeneity comes into play not only in terms of, you know, the thermal properties of the homes, but also um, the utility functions, their willingness to pay for power, and also in the, um, you know, the probabilities, the, the occupancy probabilities that evolve over time, you know, that like the Nest thermostats learning and whatnot. So, so in our experiments, you know, it doesn't, it looks like there's enough heterogeneity and randomness that that, that, that behavior where everybody just flips everything on at eight o'clock doesn't happen. Oh, interesting. That's great. I mean, if you had a deterministic model where everybody looked the same, you know, maybe you'd see some of that, you know, but when you've got, you know, probability of homeowner coming home at five o'clock is 0. 0.5 versus 0. 0.3 if the neighbor's out, you know, you just don't. You just don't see that. Great. I have a, I had a quick relevant question and, um, and it's about this implementing this, but in a dynamic way and adaptive system, uh, yeah. that assuming the nest would like to learn the patterns that the household has and take over and make quick decisions that the household cannot do in real time. Uh, is there possibility that because of the noise, the learning algorithm becomes unstable and eventually does uh, unstable control of the whole house temperature? Yeah, so as I said earlier, I mean, our model just assumes that you know those numbers, you've learned those numbers and they're, st they're not changing, you know, over time in a way that we don't already understand. So, um, um, so we haven't, you know, we haven't looked at what happens when you, when you try to learn on top of this, what those parameters are. You know, my intuition about the learning problem is that learning is pretty quick. I mean, you know, if I was Nest and I had data on lots of, um, you know, millions of people using my thermostat, I probably could guess your parameters pretty well with a little survey. I don't know if they do that or not, but I would think you could probably guess if you give me a million customers that have used my Nest thermostat for years and you tell me some basic demographic information, information about the size of their home, how many people are there, you probably could come up with reasonably good parameters. So, you know, is the thing really learning anymore? I mean, does the darn thing learn? I mean, it seems like after installing it a million times, there's really not much more learning. Maybe I like it 72.6 and you like it 72.4, but What's the value of that learning? I don't know. Um, you know, maybe my schedule's different. You know, once you tell me I'm a third shift worker, well, that that changes. You know, well, they probably have a pattern for that somewhere. So I'm not sure how I'm not sure how interesting the learning problem is. Is what I'm mm -hmm. suggesting. And even uh, if you did, even if you had learning, I think you could learn quickly with with some limited data. In fact, I mean, even from like a thermodynamic perspective, like all of the heat transfer coefficients and whatnot, with enough data from a single home, you can you can conclude, I think, what you know what the what those parameters are probably fit them reasonably well. I haven't done that exercise, but I'm guessing with enough data from a single home, you could do that. So I don't know, and it's probably not even doing anything that smart. 
by the way. I don't think it's, I don't think there's a, therm, there's a, there's a heat transfer model inside the Nest thermostat. Mm -hmm. I could be wrong, but I don't think there is. I think they're just learning what temperature you like it. Uh, Thank you, Professor Adelman. Uh, we are at the end of the time for this seminar. Thanks again for the time you spent and the presentation. You're welcome. Hope it was helpful and interesting. Thank you all. Bye.